Next, we sit down with Kathy Griffin, the president of the Illinois Education Association, and get her thoughts on the state of education in Illinois, how to improve accountability of money spent on education, and what the Supreme Court case of Janus versus AFSCME could mean for the future of teachers' unions throughout the country. This runs about 50 minutes. Kathy Griffin, thanks for joining us on the Illinois Channel. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, it was just about a year ago, a little over a year ago, you were elected to this position, and uh, I guess it'll be a year that you've been in office, you say, in what, July? July 15th will be my year anniversary. And you were a teacher <laughs> yourself, and you, what, taught grade schools, I understand? I did. I was an elementary school teacher in Schaumburg, Illinois. Uh, this is my 36th year in the education field. 30 of those were spent in Schaumburg. Wow, so uh, it's hard to believe 36, like 82, I guess, huh? Uh, 81. You start, yeah. 81, 82. Yeah. Um, before we get into the presidency and, and your agenda, how, how has teaching in those 36 years changed uh, as you've witnessed the evolution? I think the, the biggest change has been the focus on testing and making a child's success depending on a test, as well as making a decision that if a child is not at grade level, well, then the, that teacher is bad. And that didn't happen back in the 80s. Instead, we were really able to teach to the child. We were able to um, modify things to meet their needs. We were able to, we were able to make learning fun. Um, there were so many fun activities that we were able to do. But now, since we're caught in this testing um, circle, it makes it very difficult for us to bring the fun of education back to the classroom. And um, when we do so, the children don't think they're in school. They think this is, you know, this is awesome, this is fun, and they're learning so much. Mm -hmm. And um, that, that's missing. One of the activities that I did when I was in f teaching fifth grade is we studied American history. And we had colonial days where kids were from the different sections of the colonies, and they um, dressed up, they talked about the colonies, they brought in food from the colonies, and it was a great, wonderful experience. Well, we don't have time in the curriculum to do that now because we have to make sure that our kids test well. And that really saddens me because those experiences, those kids will never forget what the New England colonies were like and what they dressed like and what their habitats were and what foods they ate and how they made a living. But um, they had the experience and they're not, they don't have the time. Our, our teachers are not given the time to be able to plan those fun activities that make learning fun and also make it enriching and memorable for our kids. You know, as you say that, you remind me, and this goes back to grades, kindergarten, my kindergarten, uh, when it was all about cowboys and Indians back then, they had a flashlight and they put red crepe paper over it and a couple, and it stuck with me. I thought, isn't that cool that uh, they made a fireplace in the middle of the campfire in the middle of the classroom? Uh, so, so I can understand how those things are memorable, and sometimes those simple lessons yeah. are the things that stick with you. They really are. In sixth grade, I was um, teaching world histories, and instead of having a test, students made a pop-up book, and that pop-up book contained everything that they had learned about the different elements of each of those different. They were able to select one of the country, one of the countries we had discussed, one of the ancient civilizations. They'll, they have, I, have a stu I have a student who, who, I, who I ran into at the store a few weeks ago who told me he still has that book. And he now has graduated from college and has a, has a job. So those are the memorable moments of education that I'm afraid some of our kids aren't going to be able to have because of the structure and how you have to do certain things at certain times. And in some of our schools, um, they actually have prescribed curriculum that you're supposed to be on, you know, page 52 at 2 o'clock in the afternoon when you're teaching math if you're teaching fourth grade. So so much more regimented now. And that doesn't allow us to really do our job the way we want to. We want to make learning fun. We want kids to understand. We want them to be able to um, be great citizens, continue on in life how they want, and with the regimentedness of what's going on and the focus on test scores, that's really taken, taken the joy out of many classrooms. I'll jump ahead to where I was going to go, but it seems, is this one of the reasons why we have so many people leaving the field? They don't seem to stay as, a, as you did, but I think there's a great 
loss of teachers, isn't there, within about five years of entering the teaching field? There is a very big loss, and a lot of it is the high stress of um, trying to meet the needs of the school that they are being required to meet by their administrator. Um, and, you know, the, the, whole, the whole idea of having to make sure kids are prepared for a test because your child, the child you're teaching and you yourself are going to be evaluated on that test score, that one test score, that does not define a child, and it certainly does not define the quality of educators across, this, uh, across our state. And, yeah, that, that pressure, as well as, you know, how long it takes to get services for kids. There are so, you know, you have so many days, and these are laws that are set up by ISBE. You have so many days that you have to do this observation, and then somebody else has to come in. And this has been going on for years. I remember as a new teacher trying to get services for a child, and I came to the realization a few years down the road that it takes about a year with all of the testing and all of the legal hoop jump throughs that you have to do in order to really be able to provide the child with the extra services that they need so that they can um, have the best education possible. Is this true in other states as well? Is it a national phenomenon? I'm not certain because I've never taught in another state, but I do know that it definitely is something that's going on in the state of Illinois. And, and the, the What accounts for this? Why did it change? Um, I think that the change started a long time ago. You know, back in, I think it was 1983, um, A Nation at Risk. And I think from that point forward, um, the blame for anything that is going on with children tends to circle back to, keep to teachers. What are, the, what are the educators doing? And I mean, we've all heard, you know, people say, oh, you know, education, they're just not providing a good quality education. But then when you ask them for specifics about their school, oh, no, not my school. I love my school. My teachers do a great job with our students. And so I... Although I, there are schools, you would admit, that are not teaching well. I mean, we... I we, think that we have to look at those schools carefully because what is the reason for it? Sometimes it's because they are not adequately funded. If you don't have the tools and resources with which to work with kids to be able to provide them a quality education, you should not be penalized for it, uh, the teachers or the students, and that is going to not enhance their, um, their, their ability to learn and their experience as a student. Um, there are some schools that have textbooks that are, that are duct taped together mm -hmm. because the district doesn't have the money to purchase new textbooks. And if it's a history book, uh, they may see that the last president was, you know, President Reagan. You know, and so how are we going to make sure that those kids get a quality education? Uh, we also have to look at the structure. You know, our schools, we need to make sure we maintain them and make sure that they're safe, make sure that the learning environment is conducive for kids and they're not afraid that a ceiling tile is going to come down on them if it rains. Um, you know, there, there is more to, as, as well as trauma, you know, we've done a lot of trauma work here with IEA. And, if a and, student, and let's define what we mean by trauma. Trauma are children that have adverse childhood experiences. It might be poverty, it might be abuse at home, it might be an incarcerated um, uh, um, parent, it might be um, an alcoholic, it might be the, of a parent. You know, there, there are many different, um, many different things that can lead to children having ACEs and is what we call adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. And when children come to school and they don't know if they're going to have a meal when they go home, if they don't know if their mom or dad are going to be there, if they're alone because their parents are trying to do as much as they can by working multiple jobs to put um, a roof over their head and make sure that they have some food, you know, those are, those are what, what they come to school with. And having all that heavy on their shoulders is going to impact their ability to learn to their fullest potential. After we're, I'm, I'm going to come back to trauma. After we've done all this testing, uh, are we doing a better job? Are, are there any results? Is there, I mean, I get we're doing that for, and we're collecting data, right? And then we're going to compare the data. What does the data tell us? Are we doing a better job either because we're testing or you don't, you don't learn because of testing, but that would show whether or not I, well, at least the, ideally it's supposed to show if they're learning more. One of the interesting things about the testing in Illinois is that you test your students and the results don't come back until their students are in the next grade level. Hmm. So, um, you know, when, when we have, you know, teachers invented tests, so we're not, we're not anti-test. Oh. Mm -hmm. However, when I give a test as a classroom teacher, I'm giving a test based on the content that we have discussed as a, a class that we have, and I'm assessing if they have learned 
or if they have not. And if they have not, then I immediately know that I need to go back and I need to reteach what perhaps I didn't do a good job teaching or they didn't understand. That's the, that is what a test does. It allows for a check of have students really understood what you've done. When you give a test one year and the results come back the next year, that doesn't provide you with the ability to say, you know, this is good. I mean, I know that there's a, there are states that um, outside of Illinois that they test one year and the test results are sent to the next grade level and that teacher, her her evaluation is based on the scores from the previous year. That's how out of whack some of the testing is in our country. And we have to, you know, I have nothing, I, you know, I remember, quite honestly, I remember getting the Iowa test of basic skills when right. I was a kid. I was going to bring that up. You know, and yeah. we took that once a year, and we didn't have all of this emphasis on testing. And you know what, I think me and my, and my classmates, we turned out okay. And I was going to say, I remember taking those tests as well and filling in with the number two pencil and all. Right. Um, are, so are we, te a lot of people like myself, we're going to ex look back. We haven't been in a classroom since we, you know, at least a grade school, uh, since we were kids, except that maybe a PTA night than when you go with your children. So are we testing more throughout the year? How many tests would you have to conduct oh, throughout the goodness. course of a year? You know, it depends on uh, the child. Some of our special needs kids get tested well, let's more. Well, let's say a, just a run-of-the-mill well, student. Well, I think the big test is the state test, and that's what data is used to determine a lot of things. That's on the school report card. That is what the districts are rated on. But there are other tests that teachers do to check for understanding, and those are the ones that are beneficial for the education of children to make sure they understood and comprehended what they needed to do, as well as for the teacher to have the ability to immediately reflect and say, I did a good job teaching this, or maybe I need to reteach um, re it in a different way so that those students who didn't understand have the ability to understand and, and um, move forward. And I didn't want to uh, have us where we're talking so much about the details that we missed the forest for the trees. The big picture what is the state of education in Illinois in your mind? The state of education in Illinois, I believe, depends on where you live. Because funding is so different in so many places. And I think that the um, education funding bill that was passed is a step, is a first step in the right direction. And that's um, just now just beginning, it really. It is just beginning. But do you, you, do you, and I don't mean to cut you off, I was going to okay. say, because I wanted. So that people understand, one of the things, Senator Andy Menard was the primary author yes, of that was. bill. And it was to overcome the disparities of district Correct. from district funding. Because you would have agricultural areas with a lack of commercial establishments, uh, or areas such as in East St. Louis or South Side Chicago, right. where they, they didn't have commercial establishments, the property values, let's say, are low, and they just didn't have the money and the idea was we shouldn't have someone's educational future be dictated by the zip code you were born to right, right? right. so we're trying to it's not going to be equalized but it's going to be improved we might say right which i think is a, is a step in the right direction and something that we should have done for a long time and that's what i mean first of all what i will say is that educators across the state whether they are in low income or high income areas are amazing what our what our educators do every day with children is such a credit to who they are and um, and, and their ability to see in children what others may not see. And, and that doesn't matter where they go. Because, um, you know, I taught in uh, Schaumburg School District, which is more of an affluent district. Um, local property taxes pay for a significant portion of the district's bills, 87 to 89 percent. Um, we're, um, you know, we should not be getting extra funding because we live in an area where there's um, a lot of uh, density in housing and people that live there have chosen to pay more for their schools. Well, that school district and the opportunities that those kids get are going to be a lot more than kids in East St. Louis who don't have that funding mechanism to support. That doesn't mean that the kids in East St. Louis shouldn't have it because they should. Every district, as you said, no matter where students live, should have the tools and resources across the board 
to make sure that all students are able to, to achieve to their um, potential. Um, on, the, on the test, would you argue that, actually, I, let me just anecdotally, um, I had a friend who was a teacher in uh, St. Louis and taught English in high school, and she was complaining about the very same thing you brought up, that I'm always having the force to teach to the test. So I want to bring in Shakespeare, but Shakespeare's not on the tests, so no more Shakespeare. And I think one of the bridges uh, of a lap, uh, what I'm trying to achieve here, just with this interview and our coverage, is to bring all citizens into those realms so that you and I can understand the agricultural people and the medical people and they can understand what we're talking about in your realm with the education. Are we diminishing the, as you and I would have been raised and just with the Iowa test scores and where the teachers arguably were more creative because they could be and not as regimented uh, in the classroom as they are today. Are the Students of today getting the same quality of education, that, therefore, that the adults who might be watching this and grew up being educated in the 60s and 70s and 80s, how would you compare? Because you were teaching then and somewhat yes. a student in some of those years. Um, and, and yes, I was. I, I think that um, the quality of education that is provided by educators across the state continues to be excellent. I think that there are restrictions that are not allowing some schools to be, some teachers, some educators, to not be able to do exactly what they think they can do best for their children. I think that we need to get away from the um, testing. To so the extent that we're doing. The that. extent that we're doing, yes. You know, we, you know, no child left untested is what we've been saying, and you know that has to change because there's so much more to our kids. They are. They are just amazing. What they bring to a classroom when they're given the opportunity is, is something that nobody can ever, um, you, you, can't, you can't understand it unless you've experienced it. And I think what we need to do as a community of learners throughout the state is realize that while the brick and mortar of our schools has stayed the same, what is going on inside is so different. Um, the technology that is used when you have the tools to be able to do so to enhance learning is amazing. But if you're in a district that's still on dial-up for the internet, those students are not being able to benefit from the tools and resources that other schools are. You know, that's just one example do you, of... Do you know how many schools are on dial-up on a percentage basis as an example? I don't have that figure. I could get back to you on that, but I know that it was something when I was working with, um, I was uh, co-chair of Senator Kirk's Education Committee when he was Senator of Illinois, and one of the things that they were doing is a, um, a, a, a tour around the state, and I remember Senator Kirk calling me and saying, you were so right, I can't believe that there isn't internet connectivity to some of our schools, and I said, well, yeah. I said, we need to make sure that we get that to them because they're losing out on what could really enhance their education. Um, I mean, I know um, my daughter's a teacher. She teaches second grade. And her kids um, Skype. And they have friends in England. They have friends in Argentina. They followed the Iditarod um, journey with one of the people. They've talked to authors. They've um, had so many wonderful experiences because they have the tools necessary to allow them to have those experiences. There, there's so much. I, I feel like we're going to throw the stone across the proverbial pond and skip along to different things. One of your jobs, I think, is education. Uh, and it would be somewhat like a lawyer, on one hand, to represent your members and to educate, uh, let's say, lawmakers uh, and, and other people in, in the uh, field as far as what we're talking about. What are the realities that you want to bring to the table? When you talk to, therefore, uh, lawmakers in the General Assembly and you say, uh, we should have this change or we should have that change, uh, if, if you were granted the baton of power and could wield it to make all the changes that you wanted on your agenda, what are some of the things we would have be doing differently in school? One of the things is we would fully fund public education in the and state of Illinois. And what does that mean, fully funded? How, who, and who says that that level that you would give us means fully funded? 
I believe that the Constitution says that the state has an obligation to fund schools to a certain percentage. I don't know the exact percent, but they're not meeting that obligation now. As I said, Senator Menard's bill that passed is a step in the right direction. But we also have to make sure that our schools are safe for our kids. If you go into a school and you have ceiling tiles falling, you have a rodent problem, you have... Um, uh, you have insects that are crawling around, that is not conducive for children to learn, and it's not conducive for any human. But we have schools that are like that, and we have to take care of them. We are the key, we, are the, we, are, we, we need to make sure that the environments that our students are going to, to give them a quality education, are environments that you would want to work in, that all of us would want to work in, not something that could be threatening to our health, or threatening to our safety. And that's, I think, most important is we have to make sure we fund education the way we should, and we have to make sure that the um, environment is supported in a way that is appropriate for our kids. And we need to make sure that the, the books are updated, that the classes and the curriculum have teacher input because they know their craft so well. We shouldn't rely on people who are not in education to tell us what to do. We went to school, we work with children, we know what has to be done. So we need to have the respect to be able to put those into practice so that we can best educate our kids. Let me just bring up something. You're going to hear opposition when you talk to people. You probably handle opposition all the yes. time. But honestly, so if I was alone. Uh, but honestly, we have opposition, but there are so many people that are thankful for their public schools, especially the public schools in their neighborhood. Well, and I think uh, so many, the, the vast majority of people yes. were. And, and yes. I think almost everyone in America would say, looking back, uh, I don't remember what year, the 18, what, 80s? Or when did we start public education in America? I don't know. Some, some, somewhere back in the 1800s. It's 1800s. a wonderful thing. So everyone alive today is, I mean, we, we would all, you know, acknowledge we wouldn't be the United States of America and the gorilla on the world stage, 800-pound uh, gorilla economic, the, the, the leader in all the things that we lead in, were it not for uh, having a good education. Right. One of the things someone would likely say in, in the legislature or some of the parents, but they say, look, in every field we have bad players. We have bad doctors, bad journalists, bad lawyers, etc. We have bad teachers. If we give you more money and you say this is the amount we're supposed to have, and I say I'll sign off on that, but what accountability do we get? When do we say Sally Joe is a bad teacher and ought to be fired? And I think sometimes people think the problem with the unionization of teachers is that the union always wants to protect everyone no matter what. I don't know if that's true. That's why I want to hear from you. But I think that's one of the complaints that we get. And so, therefore, we have bad teachers. They might be one in a hundred, maybe one in a thousand. I don't know what the number would be. But that too many times we're protecting people's jobs instead of getting the bad players out of uh, out of the profession. And I would say, by the way, I don't think that's just in teaching. I think that happens in medicine and some other fields as well. But what would you respond to that? What accountability do we have well, for of, stepping up our funding? Sure. Well, when you're focusing, not stepping up funding, but when you're focusing on um, removing teachers who may not have, this may not be the best fit for them. Right. Um, we have administrators at all of our schools. Administrators gather evidence. When the evidence is gathered, a teacher can be removed. There isn't any, all we ask is that there's due process. When, when I would go to, if there was a teacher that wasn't performing well, and I was called into a meeting as a local president, I would make sure that they followed the rules, that they gathered the evidence. And then if the evidence said that this teacher was not good for kids, that teacher would be dismissed. There is nothing preventing... How long of a process is that? It depends on the... Um, it depends, but I mean, sometimes people complain, and I, I don't. Yes, I, I, I want to ask because sometimes people complain and they don't know what they're talking about, right? Right. So, uh, just to clarify, if 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 getting rid of a bad teacher is a five-year process oh, and no. costs a million dollars, I'm making no, that up. No, no. But only, I mean, that would be uh, you know cost prohibitive. And I could understand that. Is it a six? Is it a one-month thing? Is it a six-month? I'm going deal to or, say it's know? between. I, I'm guessing. Yeah. Um, but I'm going to, if somebody is following the rules according to the contract, 
and they are gathering the evidence and they are following the steps that need to be followed. It could probably be a six to nine month. But if they don't follow the rules and they just go, you know, it, it, isn't, that, it isn't that it's difficult to get rid of a, a bad teacher. What's important is that there is evidence and due process has been followed. And I will be honest with you, when you have a bad teacher, that is not something any of us who are engaged in the profession and very proud of the work we've done and have made a difference, we don't want those bad educators because one bad educator out of a thousand makes all of us look bad. But it also is very important that we make sure that people have the due process rights followed. But it is not. If you hear about something that is years and years, it means that something went wrong in the process or the administrator chose not to follow the guidelines that are established. And let's look at it in a different direction. Mm -hmm. You could have an administrator, whether it's a principal or a superintendent or whomever, uh, and maybe they're the bad player. And maybe they uh, just take a personal dislike even though someone was doing a professional job. So to make the point, you have to have some safeguards just so people right. can't be fired willy-nilly. Right, that's the whole due process career, and the right? evidence gathering, exactly. Right. Uh, and, and as far as accountability, not of the teacher, but of the school. Um, you know, I, I covered a number of education stores. There are a number of stores over the years. One was I was in Washington, D.C. doing a special report. Now, they were spending, and this was in 2003, thirteen thousand dollars a year per pupil illinois is spending approximately sixty seven hundred dollars or so so twice as much fifteen years ago and yet seventy five percent of those students with that high level of funding were performing below basic which meant they were functionally illiterate now it turned out marion berry who was the mayor of washington dc back then flooded the schools with his campaign workers as payoffs and they had just fired 800 teachers, which was unheard of, especially for, I mean, we're not talking about a state, but a city. So you can get bad for a variety of reasons. That, that was certainly uh, not representative of the whole, what happens in Illinois or around the nation. But on the other hand, when we have bad schools, is there any, from, from the standpoint of the IEA, accountability, um, you know, where we well, go in and what, rescue you, the you school know, or say, I, hey, I something's you, amiss here. I think you have to look at what you define as a bad school. Well, I mean, just as I, mean, I use that extreme in, of the Washington, okay. D.C., because obviously kids were, we were spending an enormous amount of money as a society and well, not the, getting a return the on The first it. thing I would look at is where was that money spent? Was that money spent on tools and resources for kids to learn in? Was that money spent on making sure that there was a safe environment? Or was that money spent in other ways that we don't know about? I think that, you know, the first thing you need to do is to find out, you know, follow the money and figure out what was going on. And because if it if was misspent, let's say it was being spent on sports cars for administrators, whatever, mm -hmm. how do we get accountability? Well, I think that it's up to the local members in each community if they have a locally elected school board because the school Which I would board, think they all do well right? Chicago doesn't okay so I'm I never make an assumption you're, like you're that. right I'm, I'm <laughs> <laughs> um, that's what's odd to me about Illinois is that we always carve out Chicago but which the, we shouldn't which we shouldn't but you know the the local um, the people in that local school district elect the school board members and it is the school board members responsibility to make sure that when bills are paid they are done so in a manner that is conducive for student learning or or, so, or to be part of the uh, body that holds the district accountable exactly. for why aren't we performing exactly. as well as District 186 or whatever Now, else, I'm right? going to speculate that when those 800 teachers were dismissed, all 800 of them probably were not awful teachers. I can't, I can't well, fathom. For, uh, again, I, who knows, but I, I, don't I know think they, they probably also were pushed ahead of the line, uh, you know, for political purposes and maybe weren't Well, and that's another, that's another reason why you need a local school board, that the local community can elect or unelect. They can all run and make sure that um, the funds that are sent to the district are spent in an appropriate way. Let, let's go back to um, trauma. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, and I, 
I've always been a policy wonk, so even over 35 years ago, I was having these conversations with friends who were teachers. And something stuck out with you over the years, right? And one said, well, the other day I had a student who took all their clothes off and was screaming in the hall. And I never experienced that going to school. So what happens, I think, for a lot of us who went to decent schools, and they were pretty average, you might say, we don't understand sometimes. You know, I wasn't in a low-poverty environment. I wasn't in, uh, let's look at what's happening today. And it does obviously filter through the children into the classroom. We didn't have an opioid ed epidemic before. We didn't have this then moving to heroin, as we see. Mm -hmm. And that's going across all demographic lines yes, and income brackets. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think when we as outsiders then extrapolate and say, what is going on in the classroom? We didn't have school shootings. As we sit here just yesterday in Dixon, Illinois, awesome. there was a shooter and there was a, a school resource officer mm -hmm. that fortunately was able to save lives by right. wounding the uh, would-be shooter. Mm -hmm. But these are all things, obviously, that your membership is now dealing with, which we didn't have to deal with 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. The opi you know, the, all this. So let's talk about trauma. You're, you're addressing trauma to recognize the realities of some of the things I just mentioned and some others. I guess sexual abuse was there often mm -hmm. quietly and we didn't know about it. But on the other hand, the school teacher might sense something is wrong because she's with that student on a day to day basis or he or she. So what is it, is it, uh, does it become the school's job? Does it have to become the school's job? Maybe of necessity to have some response to what they're seeing? Um, and so what, how do we deal if we identify trauma in these manners, the way uh, students are being damaged well, through their, well, their home life? Well, I think that it's important for us to realize that trauma um, takes place in all of our schools, whether they're affluent schools or they're low-income schools. And I think that's really important for us to recognize. I think what we are doing with IEA is we actually are bringing together teachers, administrators, community members, social services, um, and so on to train them in recognizing what um, attributes will a student have if they are having some trauma or some ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. And having the knowledge allows you to be able to work with that student better. I truly, from the bottom of my heart, do not believe that a child comes to school and says, I'm going to get in trouble today because that's what I want to do. I don't believe that is in their heart. But some children come to school because it's the safest environment for them. And when children feel safe, they often act out. And so as educators, we have to realize that um, the student who may have acted out, instead of immediately saying, you're going to the principal's office, we need to have a conversation with them. We need to talk with them. We need to find out what's going on so that we can provide the services that they need. Right now, IEA has already can, trained... Can I interrupt there on that, that we have to provide the services they need? Is we the schools? I think it's the community, the school. You know, we need more social workers. We need more counselors. We need more psychologists and, and nurses. And what I want to insert here, or to ask, so if we identify a student, are we funding those services in the school budget or is the school sending out those students to be treated in other people's budgets the hospital's budget the, the, well, the mental health budget currently in Illinois yeah. we're not um, we're not working with all of the other agencies and I know that Senator Lightford who um, has been one of our champions on trauma work um, and educating educators and communities on trauma it has mentioned we need to start pulling our resources together because it can't all fall on the shoulders of schools. Right. But at the same time, we also need to make sure that our educators are aware of the signs and how to um, go about having those conversations, how to relate to those students and not immediately say, you're out of here, you're kicked out of school for this behavior. We need to have those conversations. We have trained um, 2,500 people so far in trauma-informed, um, in our trauma-informed trainings. Some of those are trainers um, 
are, have taken the training, the, the training to be trainers to, tr to train others. So we're trying to have this movement go out. We've been fortunate to work with pediatricians from um, different areas of the state, from SIU and two from up in the Chicagoland area, who have been instrumental in helping us. Um, we've, we've also, um, in the South Suburban area, we have a partnership for resilience which focuses on trauma, but it also focuses on there are kids there who have had problems with school, and we find out when a vision van comes up, it's because they can't see. They need glasses, but they've never been able to go to an optometrist to get a check. We have other kids that when the dental van comes up who have been, you know, not paying attention because they have toothache and that's taking over. You know, so these are elements of ACEs, of not being able to, uh, poverty, um, and, and all kinds of things that we're really seeing is all about educating the whole child. We have to educate them cognitively, but we also have to make sure that we understand what's going on with them so that we can provide the services when possible to make sure that we're meeting their needs. I think those are good points on glasses and dental work. People would understand that. And there's a, sadly, you know, we're going to have people living in poverty that don't have uh, those services available to them. Some might argue to the extent that you can't teach because you're testing too much, can you teach if all of a sudden you become a social worker? And on the soft, let's say, you know, if it's a broken bone, you, you maybe get the, the bone fixed. But how do you deal with a kid who has an abusive parent uh, and you feel for the child but do we stop educating 25 people in a classroom while the teacher becomes a social worker for the child I, I don't know what the answer is I'm not proposing but I'm, I'm saying how do we do that I can hear people in my back of my mind having that argument if we turn the schools so do we say, hey, that kid needs to go out and be treated because they're suffering, and maybe we have the Department of Human Services get involved? Well, you know, that's, that's something that we might be able to do in the future. But right now, I think um, if we have more social workers and more counselors and more um, nurses, they can, you know, if a student acts that way, I then, as a classroom teacher, have a resource that will be on site at the school to begin that process. And I'm not a social worker, but I know that they have lots of connections with different agencies in the community, and they might be the ones who could answer that question better than I. Uh, a nurse would know if, it, you know, could, could do a quick eye screening. We do it with our young kids all the time yeah. in areas that have the ability to do so. So let's do that eye screening and see what we can do and then connect them to the Lions or you know whatever groups might be able to assist I think that people, child. I, I would say the average person probably clearly understands that mm -hmm. one pretty. And that's, that's I think, not only reasonable, but I think can be handled in a reasonable way. But, but you know what? I, I would, um, unfortunately, I'm not a social worker, but I know that a lot of our um, schools that are able to have social workers, they do take the time to talk with those students that are um, in need, and that allows the classroom teachers to be able to carry on with the um, education for those other kids that are still in the classroom. Uh, I want to make sure we get to a couple other things without going four hours, <laughs> which we probably could, not think, but um, let me ask something that just occurred on this thing. Uh, I think it was roughly 30 years ago we had um, Head Start as a problem, so we're taking preschool kids and often the, the idea was along these lines to get them to where they can, whatever, learn their colors and ABCs. I'm not all sure what they teach, but also to get them a meal and uh, kind of get them ready just to the regiment of going to a school. H have you seen from your own teaching or just from your conversations in the field, uh, has something like Head Start made a difference that is obvious Head Start in early childhood is basically what you're talking about. They make a huge difference. We know when a child comes to school ready and when they don't. Um, I, I remember our kindergarten teachers, you know, that that is a difficult, although people think, oh, a kindergarten teacher, that's an easy job. Well, yeah. when students walk in the door, some have had 
early childhood experiences and they know their letters, they know their colors, they know, you know, they know their address, they know how to tie their shoes, they know they have all that. And then you have others who come in and don't even know how to hold a book the right way because they've not had that experience. So anytime we can provide early childhood, which is becoming more and more common in districts that can afford it because we see the benefit of it, we want to do that as well as with Head Start. When you do some of that on the front end of a child's learning, oftentimes you then reduce the um, probability that they'll need special education as they get older. So anything we can do to support early childhood education, Head Start, and so forth, preschool, we need to continue to do that because it makes a dramatic difference in a child's ability. Let me go into something, and I'm trying to not just purposely ask about things that are That's okay. not ill and all the things, but technology is revolutionizing every field. Yes, it is. Uh, I think we all know that, just inherently. When we have someone like Head Start, which are, it could be any age, you don't have to be younger, but the point is you're going to have people who are at different levels. Mm -hmm. And in some form, we are teaching as if it's the 1880s. We have a teacher in front of a classroom talking to however many people we have, 15, 20, You need 30. to go visit a school. That's not what's going on inside schools. Well, it, well, maybe I probably do, but uh, but where are we going with technology is is more the question, and to what extent uh, is the f the field at large, the, the everybody, the administrators, the teachers, looking at you know maybe with the my goodness, look, we're just about to have the virtual reality come in. Where I had someone down in Massac County tell me we have kids in high school that never left the county. But with a virtual reality, they could take a tour of Paris and be walking down the streets of Paris when you're talking about the French Revolution or, mm -hmm. you know, Stratford-on-Avon when you're talking about Shakespeare, if you ever do. What do you see looking into the future? What are those trends of, uh, of technology, and to what extent is that an opportunity? To what extent is it a challenge to integrate this for the students, to train teachers? You know, so we don't want to make it just always sound like you're just a union. You're, you're, you're educators. Mm -hmm. You're dealing with technology just the same as everyone else. Um, we are, and I think that the first piece of that is we have to make sure that schools have the resources to be able to provide the tools to have that virtual experience or that technology And what experience. is broadband? And as well as broadband, which is huge. Um, if, a, if a school doesn't have that, then we are not providing them the quality education that we could. Right. Um, I think that there's no limit to what can happen um, in a classroom. You know, I, I'm um, fortunate to be able to visit classrooms. And what is going on when you have um, two different classes studying something and then they compare notes and they talk about it with one another? I have little, I've seen little kids um, actually practice their reading of a book by Skyping to another child in another part of the district and they exchange books and they talk about it and they read to one another gives them that experience and that confidence without having to be up in front of the room just yet. Um, I have seen classes that have, um, you know, uh, created um, amazing, um, uh, amazing things on the computer that are then presented and shared with their, co with their, with their peers. Uh, there is no, I don't think there is, um, uh, uh, there isn't anything that's going to close the opportunities that are going to be available when we have the tools and resources to provide. No, but I guess the thing is, uh, it, you know, when I look at some of the unions, and uh, we, I had the pipe fitters president on our board for a while, mm -hmm. and it's amazing to me that I can go into a hotel in New York City on the 80th floor and have water pressure. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to know what yes, you're doing to, to make that happen. Mm -hmm. So I look at unions. Uh, not in the traditional way that sometimes people think of them. I look at them as educators. Whether Absolutely. you're educating the next generation to be pipe fitters or airline mechanics or airline pilots or teachers, educating teachers. Well, what, and to what extent are we looking backwards? And by backwards, I mean dealing with what comes to us on our plate, like this craziness of school shootings that you have to deal with. And to what extent does the industry uh, look forward and say, we are going to have virtual reality. We have all this technology. We didn't even have these cell phones 10 years ago. And how do we integrate that? And who looks at uh, whatever technology it is and says, what can we do with this 
instead of how we've done it before? Do, do, do you, I do understand. Is that part of your we, job? We, we have professional the, the development for our members. We have both online professional development as well as um, uh, in face-to-face -face professional development. In addition to that, whenever we meet, we are always talking, you know, teachers talk talk shop all the time you know so what cool thing did you do with your kids today and what did you do with your kids and and um, in, in our schools um, through professional development that is there teachers share different strategies and different things that they're doing to constantly improve and uh, that's one thing that I know every teacher I know of um, I don't know everything and I'm always wanting to learn right. because the more I learn the better it is for my kids and so it isn't like we're not continuing to move forward. We are constantly sharing what we're doing. We are constantly educating ourselves. We are constantly providing professional development um, where we can um, to make sure that we have teachers that are on the cutting edge of technology and be able to infuse that into their classrooms in a way that just seems natural. Instead of, you know, back in the day when computers first came out, you had computer classes. You know, well now, computers are part of your classroom if you're in a district that can afford those tools and resources and it's just embedded into what you do daily. Uh, and I can just imagine, uh, I think we all ought to imagine, uh, if you were to take a well-met school district and compare it to an East St. Louis school district, not to pick on East St. Louis, but I mean there's going to be pockets of poverty around the state and we're going to have broad inequality as far as the resources in in the schools. And that's wrong. We as a society should never allow that to happen. And we have allowed it to happen. And we're taking the first step to correct it. And I would say, and I say this as someone who's had business owners, a business owner and bought equipment. Equipment tick is cheap uh, because it it lasts for years and doesn't ask for a raise. I mean, you don't know, it's a static sure. investment for at least a period of five or ten years typically, depending upon what it is. And even if it's a little outdated after ten years, it's better than not having anything. So um, let me go to, uh, before we close out, one of the bigger issues that could be certainly bubbling up and we anticipate as we tape this in the middle of May, probably within the next two to three weeks, uh, we'll, well, three to four weeks, we'll get a decision from the U.S. Supreme Court on a case that came out of Springfield, Illinois, and actually was prompted by a lawsuit brought by Governor Rauner. Mm -hmm. that, that could hold huge implications, not just for educators, but, uh, uh, and it wasn't an education issue, but uh, for unions in general. And that was the, the Janus case, named for a state worker in Illinois, Mark Janus, here in Springfield. Uh, who doesn't want to be uh, doesn't want to be forced into being part of the union? If that were to be granted, if Mark Janus wins that case, uh, then people could say, "I don't want to be represented by the IEA." Give us your overall thoughts on on that case and what are the implications for society that we should care about this? Well, I think, as you stated at the beginning, the case was originally filed by Governor Rauner, and a judge said he would not be the appropriate person because he was not part of a union. He didn't have standing. He didn't have standing, exactly. So he found a um, ASME employee, Mark Janis, who wasn't happy, um, and he put his name on it. And we also have to be cognizant of the fact of who is funding Mark Janis's case to the Supreme Court. And it is um, very wealthy people who are not pro-union. Um, but they have their right to have their arguments too, right? Oh, I mean, absolutely, absolutely. However, so, so I'd want to hear the merits of the argument. How, however, in my opinion, what is being done is um, very wealthy people are trying to take the voice of the middle class worker away. I think that's what this is about. It is not about whether Mark, I mean, Mark Janis has never turned down a raise. He has never said, I don't want my benefits. He has never done any of those things. And so when you are represented by a union and you have collective bargaining and they bargain for you your wages, your benefits, your working conditions, um, you, you should, since you are benefiting from that collective bargaining agreement, you should have to pay a portion. And that's what agency fee people do. Okay? What if, um, just for the sake of argument, uh, 
someone said, I don't want to be, let's say Janice wins, you would still have the IEA, you would still mm -hmm. do collective bargaining. The difference is teacher Sam might say, um, I don't want to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. it. Would it be fair and okay if uh, teacher Sam then didn't get the raise or didn't get the benefits? Well, that we was would still be the, the bargaining person for teacher Sam. Okay. Um, and could, I think he, could he be forced to pay his dues but not be a member? Oh, if the Janus case prevails for yes, Janus? Yes. No, no. He would be what we would call a free rider. Okay. Somebody who is benefiting from collective bargaining, who is benefiting from the collective voice of unions, and just walking down the street with a smile on his face. And, and quite honestly, um, that's a really sad place to be. And um, if, the Janus if the Janus case does not go in our favor, we're going to have some changes. We, we definitely will. But I truly believe that um, members that will stay with the union are those who will make us stronger than we've ever been before. We have to take into account some of the states around us, or not around us, but you've got West Virginia, you've got Arizona, Colorado, um, Kentucky, um, Oklahoma. Those are states that do, they, they are right to work states. They all went on strike. And before we had the collective bargaining agreement in Illinois, we had more strikes than we've ever had before. So I, I don't believe that this case is going to ever silence the voice of our members because we are pro-public education. And this, this case is not just against public unions. It is against public education. We need our voice because our voice protects our students. We need to have the voice so that we have, um, we, we know what conditions we want because a teacher's working conditions are our students' learning conditions. We need to be part of those decisions as to what is good for curriculum and what isn't. We need to have a voice because our voice will make public education continue to be strong. And however this case turns out, IEA is not going away. We will continue to advocate for our members and most importantly our students because we believe in public education and the importance of it.